so we are at a relatively unique uh, position with regard to workshops in that we're ahead of schedule, uh, materially ahead of schedule. <laughs> uh, and uh, Dr. Lieberman, Dr. Clancy uh, have been gracious enough to stay with us and have consented to uh, address any additional questions that may have occurred to folks uh, over the, the course of, of the session. Uh, and Mark uh, Murray should be available as well online. So if there are any other uh, questions or comments, rebuttals, rejoinders, editorials, whatever, uh, now would be the time to uh, voice them. Um, go ahead. Is it the VA? Can you hear me now? Is that okay? And I have a question for Mark Murray online. He's still there. Mark, are you still with us? I know you are, but. Mark, are you on mute? He's not, on, okay. Uh, if you want to ask your question, uh, go ahead, but Mark, and I should say that uh, Mark uh, joined us remotely. He has a very important uh, family uh, event happening uh, today and uh, took time out of that to uh, join us remotely, but uh, I am reminded that he did say that he was going to have to uh, devote himself to his other responsibilities for uh, much of the day and so probably uh, won't be rejoining us uh, as far as I know anyway. So, Mike, you want to go ahead and? Sure. So my question was about the finding of the initial workshop that said that prioritizing care res did not solve the delay problem, <clears throat> which I understand from a systems uh, perspective. Uh, at the same time, VA has had to prioritize care because we have patients with time-sensitive needs. And so for the... I don't know, for the workshop attendees, it'd be interesting to just know where that line is and where that balance is between, you know, when to prioritize and how much to prioritize and not also cause uh, negative effects in the overall waiting time. I think there's a tension there and there's some learning to be done. So that's, that's where my question is. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think um, since Mark's not with us, we are going to note that, keep it in mind, and I suspect it will be uh, touched on in uh, at least two of the other sessions, if not more, uh, as we progress through the, uh, the workshop. So if we uh, don't address it at a point where you think it, it should be, please remind us. So uh, Don Goldman from Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston Children's Hospital, and, and actually anybody on the planning committee or Carolyn or you could probably help me with this. So I'm struggling having heard Mark's really uh, beautiful uh, discussion about access, care coordination, patient-centered care, and scheduling to figure out how when I get up there and give my little piece, I'm going to uh, talk about scheduling without contextualizing it and all the rest. And I'm just wondering, it, are we thinking about scheduling in the light of all of the IT-oriented aspects of access and care coordination and patient-centered care, or are we really going to look at the attributes of the ideal scheduling system? Or maybe I'm not understanding what the word scheduling means in this meeting. I, I think that would help frame which end of the elephant we're looking at? So I'm going to take the prerogative to uh, try to address that and give Steve and Carolyn and others a, a chance to cogitate on, on what their response might be. Um, in thinking about the, the workshop uh, and what a scheduling system uh, would do, certainly the mindset of the planning committee uh, is that virtual care 
uh, is not just a part of, but may well be the dominant part of care uh, going forward. Now, no one is there uh, today. VA is perhaps ahead of, of many, uh, if not most all other uh, healthcare systems in that regard. But uh, whether it's telehealth or mHealth or you know the other uh, modalities that can be used to connect people uh, and exchange information, uh, have to be somehow factored into and, and built into the scheduling system. And that's, if you may recall the, the uh, which you probably don't, uh, the uh, uh, image that was shown on the, the top of the bridge uh, were some rate or some signals that, that were going on. That was meant to communicate this idea of, of being able to connect virtually uh, with the system. Uh, now, how that happens, uh, how that gets operationalized presents a whole bunch of, of uh, challenges and, and choices. Uh, some of which we uh, will uh, talk about over the course of this workshop. Yeah, uh, just the idea uh, is that patients in their myriad settings uh, as they're trying to connect with a provider are increasingly going to be connecting through virtual means. Uh, and uh, that has to be built into the scheduling system. And how that happens uh, you know, as I said, uh, there are a number of challenges and, and questions and, and choices will have to be made uh, going forward. But I uh, am reminded of a, um, I forget who, uh, which uh, entity uh, said it, but they were talking about, or there was an article about the virtuals of uh, minute clinics and, and uh, some of the, the clinics in your local a uh, pharmacy or whatnot, and, and the, the point was that that's nice, but wouldn't it be a lot nicer if you just did that in from your living room? Um, and I think that's in many ways the mindset that we, we have to get to is how do we make as much care as possible, as convenient as possible for uh, the health system user uh, using these virtual modalities? Well, Ken, I'm thrilled because I was afraid I'd have to rip up my talk. But now, but now you made it clear I don't. Uh, I, I would just, uh, this is just something that was occurring to me as I was sitting there pondering the ideal attributes of a scheduling system. Uh, maybe we can try and imagine the future uh, without anything called the scheduling system. Uh, let's, say, let's imagine what care and access coordination would look like, prevention, health thriving, without a scheduling system. I, I don't know, I have no model in my mind. But I, I think when I listen to you talk, uh, the hard architecture of a system for scheduling ten, tends to evaporate into the atmosphere of uh, connected health and so forth. So just something to think about while we're doing this work. Yeah, VA really is uh, on the frontier here. Uh, and uh, as uh, Carolyn noted, there's a whole lot of things that uh, are currently uh, being operationalized in the VA, um, but as it is looking forward uh, to the future and, and the future state, uh, we really need to reconceptualize what all this means, and, and in particular, um, this whole idea of what does access mean uh, in the 21st century, uh, and you know, access, it is increasingly anachronistic at a minimum to think of access as face-to-face -face visits. I don't see anybody at the microphone, so I'm going to make one last comment yeah. about the VA. Uh, I, I know nothing about the VA. I'm the last person in the world you want here. I'm not a veteran. I've never utilized veteran administration services, so I feel like a fool uh, standing here. But I will say this. The one thing I've heard is that part of the uh, joy of veterans coming to a VA facility is the networking, social support uh, that they get from community. So whatever you're thinking about in terms of the virtual world, uh, think about how to not lose that, because that is what will draw people to a VA facility, not necessarily a star rating. And, and that's an important point, because one of the things you hear consistently from veterans is that socialization experience. So uh, I don't know if anybody here in the front row, row uh, Carolyn, you may want to. So, Don, I think it's a great question. And just building, yeah. 
No, no. I mean, just uh, building on what Ken just said, this really is a frontier. So we've been admiring his slide, and we've dutifully recorded it on, on our well on our phones. But thank you; it's really terrific. Um, but if you just look at this slide, the primary care specialty care issue, I'm reminded that. Um, in the early days of health IT, as John Holamka would know well, right, as long as electrons were dancing uh, across, uh, then people presumed that coordination would happen sort of like gravity, um, which is completely, totally ludicrous. We actually have a shot at care coordination because we actually have some standard system rules which have, or what I would call operating rules or principles that have nothing to do with the scheduling system, right, but that, you know, for the majority of needs, you're going to primary primary care, which is integrated with mental health, before you're going to a specialist, and so on and so forth. Um, a scheduling system can't solve that problem, right? A system has to actually make those rules. Um, a system is going to have to grapple with the resource, the macro resource implications of lots of people providing care from home to someone else's home, that we don't need space for them anymore. We're not there yet, but um, it's not that far away, and so forth. So I don't think we completely walk away from that challenge, but I liked the way that Mark had framed it that, you know, getting to now was about this kind of vision, and the purpose of this workshop is to enable the next step. So Eva, I'm really glad you're here as human continuity. <laughs> So, Leone, maybe you might want to comment. I know telehealth is certainly near and dear to you. Thank you, Ken. I'm just going to hold this. Um, my name is Leone Hayworth. I'm the director of Palo Health, the Office of Care at VHA. Um, and I wanted to share in the context of our discussion as we move forward about expanding access to um, one of the digital divide initiatives that our office is overseeing. Um, and one of those specifically, as Dr. Kaiser mentioned, is how can we really optimize getting care into the home? Why wouldn't you rather do it from your living? We really embrace that um, for veterans who have their own devices and even for veterans who do not. We have a loan tablet program um, that has been sponsored so that we can to as many veterans who need it as possible, and understanding that many of our veterans actually live rurally and may not have access to the 4G cellular services that many of our urban veterans have. So how can we help them, and how can we help them in the context of knowing that veterans often enjoy a lot of camaraderie when they come to the VA medical centers for their face-to-face -face visits? So one of our key initiatives is a partnership with the VFW and the American Legion to set up telehealth access points um, in locations where veterans have historically had to travel a long distance to receive care at VA facilities. So setting up spaces where veterans can go, they can be with their community, and they can receive services, and that continuity of VA care and a community that supports them. Um, we may even see some impact on increasing enrollment of veterans who previously thought VA services were too far and inaccessible to them. Um, as well as the opportunity to potentially make a dent in, in suicide prevention, since we know a lot of those are actually not enrolled veterans in our care. So just wanted to make the, that brief note. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lehman, did you have a, a comment or, or question? Uh, so I'm Lisa Lehman, uh, Visit 1 CMO. I was just going to respond to uh, Don's uh, caution, um, uh, which I think is really important in terms of the uniqueness of VA and the relationships that our veterans have when they come to the VA, and, and point out that even as we move towards more telehealth, if that's what our veterans want, we also have, as a healthcare system, given our commitment to veterans' health and well-being, created a whole system of whole health, which we are rolling out throughout our system. And that system of whole health includes many other other opportunities for veterans to interact with other veterans outside of clinical care. So even as we work towards better scheduling and easier access and coordination of care clinically, we've also created an infrastructure to allow veterans to maintain that unique relationship that they have with other veterans um, through, our, through our VA. Joe? And uh, just to build on uh, that, that sort of construct, too, I think uh, when we think about scheduling systems and think about sort of that as an operating mechanism of making these kinds of connections, I think in our steering committee, too, Mark brought it up, 
where all of that is a means of an end of actually increasing health towards the veterans, and somehow you can accelerate five quick appointments that may or may not generate more health that could actually potentially make things more complicated. So as all of this comes together, I think it is incumbent of us to keep anchoring on the fact of what are we facilitating to actually get towards better health of the veterans in the community. Ken, I'm wondering if I could just make one more comment, um, given that you have this slide up and uh, Several people have alluded to the complexity uh, of scheduling, and what Carolyn did such a great job laying out um, all the different things that exist in our system right now in, in terms of scheduling, how complex that is, and how challenging it is for the individuals who are trying to do this. And our hope that the CERNO uh, approach will simplify things somewhat. One of the challenges that we didn't recognize yet that I, I'm concerned about uh, sort of at the front line level is the classification of from a human resources perspective of our MSAs of the individuals who are tasked with this complex task and even if we simplify it the, the grading and classification level is at the lowest possible level in our system. It's like a GS-5 or 6. There's no ladder for building um, of professional growth within that. And I, I think that we need to sort of figure out as we're trying to move forward here how we're going to address that human resources issue, which is uh, part of the problem of dealing with the complexity of this health management system. Thank you. And, and um I would echo that, and uh, you know the schedulers are often the unsung heroes uh, of the system in, in getting people in, and I don't think it's generally appreciated uh, how difficult their job can be and some of the pressures uh, that they face in, in the real world, as Carolyn was talking about, as people get anxious and unhappy with them and, and the, the human uh, side of things they, they have to deal with, and I do hope that as uh, one of the outcomes uh, of this would be a relook at uh, uh, classification uh, schemes and, and uh, career pathways and other uh, related things uh, with regard to these uh, healthcare professionals, uh, which I think has largely been uh, overlooked and, and ignored over the years, but has repeatedly been called out uh, in a number of assessments. I know. Uh, in the report that uh, Booz Allen did in 2008, uh, this issue was specifically called out as a problem with the scheduling system uh, at that point, and I, I know they weren't the first ones to, to note it either. So are there any other questions or comments at, at this point, uh, either in the room or on the, uh, the phone virtually? Mia? Hi, I'm Mia Powers Higgins. I work for the Office of Veterans Access to Care. Um, and I just wanted to um, have a comment for um, the last person that spoke regarding MSAs and their classification and our qualification standards. We are actively working and looking at that. We've been having, we've had a group of SMEs or subject matter experts to look at where they are now, where the progression can be, involve some career progression so they don't leave and look at other avenues in which we can enhance their experience. Um, we've even worked with HR, so it's not just money is the reason why MSAs don't want to stay is, is a lot of it deals with their environment, how they're valued. So we have to have an active assessment also in regards to how are we looking at these individuals? How important are they to us? And making sure that we ensure that they understand that information. So we are looking at that. I, and I, I, I'm open to make sure we get any comments from here to take back to that group. Thank you. So we are still uh, significantly ahead of schedule, but seeing no other uh, questions or hearing none uh, on the phone, I think we will go ahead and take a break. I want to uh, thank Drs. Lieberman and Clancy and Murray, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ruoff, uh, for their uh, comments. I, I think we're off to a good start. Uh, the agenda. Uh, shows us starting at 10.30. However, I am going to ask that we reconvene at 10.20 um, to try to take advantage of uh, building in a little bit of extra time. I think as the program moves forward, we're going to get more into the weeds on some things, and, and some of the topics are going to get a little more complicated, and we, and we are unlikely to maintain the uh, time advantage that we have at the moment. Uh, 
So we are officially on break. There's coffee, bathrooms. See you back in 20 minutes or so.